So, um, so, anyway, so welcome everybody to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center at CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of programs and the executive director of the Siegel Center. We do bridge the academia and professional theater, international and American and theater. And we are close towards the end of the season, but uh, like in every good production in theater, where people say you have to have something really good in the beginning and you have to have something really good at the end. So if something in between doesn't completely work out, people will forgive you. Now we're coming closer to the end. And um, we just had a great evening with the Italian players. And now we have something, uh, again, very uh, significant, I think, and, uh, and, a great, uh, and a great evening. So we have um, tonight Gianna with us. And here she is, and flew in from Bucharest. Where did you come? The day before uh, yesterday, just totally to be here with us. We um, have a history with her. We uh, had her as a guest eight years ago, and I had a reading um, of her play, one of her plays, and also we published it in our volume, which, we, which was outside, and we will also have it um, later on. And um, it is my um, uh, great uh, pleasure to also have Christina um, with us tonight, who came to us with the idea we are friends, Christina Kim to our program. She likes our Cradle Festival and the other things we do. So we are in a constant dialogue, as with so many other supporters. And, um, and uh, tonight we will hear a truly extraordinary uh, play um, directed uh, by uh, Tamila, um, who um, also has a long history with us. So it's a wonderful, uh, in a way, a family evening, but also a very global um, 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 presentation um, of things we always do here. So um, thank you all um, for coming. So the structure of the evening will be uh, introductions. A few words uh, I ask for, uh, to, uh, for ten, 10 minutes to our contemporary theater in Romania. Of course, it's not enough. It's a fantastic uh, culture in Romania. It's great, great theater culture for a long time. Also actually having a Yiddish theater, one of the few really working Yiddish theater, which is uh, theater on its own across from the National Theater. Moshe Azur often was here. Um, directs and works there um, a lot. And um, even so, only one of all the actors uh, you know, comes from a Jewish uh, European background, but people learn a uh, Yiddish language and uh, perform, and the audience also in Romania is not really a part of the big <coughs> Jewish community, but they do come, and for over 40 years or 50 years now, they've created something incredibly special. We once in the evening about this. Here, so after the reading, there, after the introduction, will be a reading, 40, 50 minutes, and there will be a little Q&A and some, some um, questions also with you, and then a reception here in this uh, very, very room. So again, thank you all for coming. I know it's the holiday season, and most of our colleagues have folded their tents, <laughs> and uh, that's it. Uh, and we uh, think if we have a great program, so great things, you know, we really uh, want to show them, want to make it happy, and we want to say yes instead of no, and thanks for Marvin Kelsen, who is here with us tonight, a great way to support of the Siegel Center, but also professor of theater here at the Graduate Center, a very significant force in internationally and globally, one of the leading um, professor of theater, Bonnie Maranka from PHA Art Journals, Chrissy Brown from Arts Link, so, and many, many others, so really, it means a lot to us to have such a great, great audience, as we always say, it's good to have a, a good, important theater, but we also need a really, really um, good audience, so thank you for uh, being here with us tonight. My last uh, uh, note is about the phone. Just take a moment, I'll do the same, take it out, please, and check that it's off. So it doesn't ring, okay, mind it off now. And then, um, before I hand it over to Christina, it is my um, great, uh, a pleasure to say in deep gratitude our thanks to the Romanian and Cultural Institute in New York. Um, can you raise your arms uh, over yeah, here, out here, from the Romanian Cultural Institute, who also um, does exceptional work, I think, um, from all the choruses of uh, cultural institutes um, uh, in the city, and also in over a long, a long period of time, so you're also with your former colleagues. Um, so um, thank you for being here and supporting us, Christina. Thank you so much, Frank, for this kind introduction. Uh, and thank you. Um, it's kind of formal here, but um, yeah. Um, thank you for being so open to the um, to the idea of introdu introducing 
Romanian theater um, in your series of international theater. Um, that's a, a, a very important step for us. Uh, we were just talking with Janina um, earlier on that we were here eight years ago when you published, uh, Martin Siegel Center um, published a, a volume with Romanian uh, new plays. Um, and here uh, now, that's the, the next step. Um, it, it's going to be a very, very short presentation because of course there are a lot of, of things to say about Romanian theater. But um, just to lay the, a little bit the background for um, this new, for, to understand how this new generation emerged, uh, I'm going to um, divide the recent history of Romanian theater in before 1989 and after 1989, uh, the moment when uh, the political regime changed in Romania, um, and we started our long and uh, very um, complicated uh, transitional uh, journey from communism to capitalism. Uh, it's a very interesting journey, especially for playwrights. They have a lot of, uh, of things to, um, to pick up from this, uh, these changes, and uh, so they do. Uh, so before 1989, um, next slide. Um, to just a few words about the uh, Romanian theater was very text-based, um, so uh, they were the directors were um, engaging classical texts mostly, uh, less new new uh, new plays because the propaganda was using the, the playwrights of the time. Uh, so uh, directors were afraid sometimes and avoiding um, uh, taking on the new plays. Um, because they, they were uh, commissioned by the regime. Uh, so what happened was that the directors were um, engaging in a conversation with uh, the audience uh, using these classical texts uh, and uh, building a metaphorical language uh, full of allusions and uh, uh, forcing somehow the spectators to read between the lines. Which it was a game of cat and mouse, uh, mice and in a way, and uh, the, the public uh, enjoyed it very much. Um, after um, after this, uh, and the illusions were called uh, lizards because uh, the ability of the small animals. It was a compar comparison with the, the ability of the small animals to sneak around. Uh, so it was a conversation uh, outside the, the classical text. Um, and uh, followed uh, all the time by the censorship. Uh, next slide. Uh, the censor censorship uh, commissions were those who uh, were always um, uh, coming to the last <laughs> rehearsals uh, to check if uh, everything uh, was according to the rules of the, uh, of the regime. Uh, of course, uh, Sometimes it, it was not enough, even if they um, allowed it, the, the artists to go on with the rehearsals and the opening night. After the opening night, sometimes they stopped the production, they banned it. Uh, this happened with a lot of productions, uh, especially one of the most uh, uh, well-known scandals in Romania at uh, that time, in 1961, uh, was the banning of the um, Inspector General, a production um, directed by uh, Lucian Pintivie, who is also a famous Romanian filmmaker. Um, and because of this, uh, um, Lucian Pintivie was not allowed to direct in the theater anymore, uh, and he left the country. Um, of course, there was, it, it was followed, this was followed by a wave, uh, an entire wave of uh, um, theater directors and artists uh, leaving the country in exile uh, all around the world. Um, and um, that was a, a gain for other theater movements, of course, uh, and a loss for ours. Um, Radu Benchilescu, David Esri, Lucian Giurchescu, Andrei Sherman, um, now teaching at Columbia University, uh, and many, many others. Uh, in the next show, you will see Liu Tulei, uh, who at that time was um, the manager of the of Bulandra Theater, where the Inspector General was staged. Uh, and he also lost his position as manager, and he uh, finally uh, also left the country. Uh, he also um, ran for a, a while the Gafri Theater, uh, and then he teached, uh, uh, he taught at, um, at New, York, New York University and then Columbia. Uh, and of course, uh, the same happened with Andre Sherman. Um, they, all of them, uh, they came after 1989, 
they came back in Romania and they fortunately connected with the next generation, uh, the younger generation, and this was a very important uh, phenomenon in Romania because uh, young uh, theatre people, um, they had the chance to reconnect with these uh, amazing theatre uh, people, theatre artists. Um, that was before. The next one, please. Uh, after 1989, the 90s was um, a, a decade of uh, theatre mixing with politics uh, very much, sometimes too much. Um, they were uh, very uh, troubling years. Um, a famous actor, uh, Ion Karamit, was of the, one of the faces of the Romanian Revolution, uh, and he toured a lot because of that. Um, he was uh, um, very famous back then, and he's still very influential in Romanian theater. Some even say too influential. Uh, I'm saying that because you have to understand the dictatorship model uh, in, uh, that we inherited from the communist regime is still working sometimes in Romania. Uh, in many fields, not only in theater. Um, next, please. Um, so in the 90s, also, um, a very important uh, director emerged, uh, Silvio Borgarete. Uh, you can see him here with, uh, together with Romu Stromer, his favorite set designer. Um, Borgarete uh, took a lot in the 90s, and he was uh, really very famous. Uh, I started going to international festivals in 96, 1996, 1997, and every time I was saying I'm from Romania, uh, someone would come and say, Purcarete, <laughs> like uh, it was the hello of that time in theater. Uh, next, please. Uh, he toured all over the world, first with productions from the National Theater in Craiova. Most of his uh, productions were based on, um, on Greek uh, tragedies, not all of them, but most of them. And then he, um, he staged a lot of opera productions in opera houses all around the world. Uh, and for a while, he was the manager of the Limoges Dramatic Center in France. Um, here, th that, that this is a picture from Metamorphosis, uh, based on all these lyrics, produced by the Civil National Theater. Um, next, please. Uh, and here, this is a picture from Faust, uh, an adaptation uh, that he made, and he presented uh, a lot on tour, uh, including in Edinburgh in 2009. <coughs> um, and uh, the picture shows Ophelia Poppy. Uh, she's an amazing actress, and I chose her because she's also one of the actors, uh, actors working with uh, Jania Hernayo in Sibiu Theater. Um, next. The most interesting uh, things uh, started to happen uh, in 2000, starting with 2000. Uh, when non-conventional performing spaces were starting to be used and in a wave of new drama uh, emerged. Uh, and next, uh, one of the things that happened was that the parallel culture uh, started to, uh, to emerge and they used uh, non-conventional spaces, especially underground uh, cafes, um, not the public theaters, uh, even though we have a lot of public theaters in Romania, this, uh, this is also inherited by, uh, from the communist regime. Uh, public theater uh, sponsored by the state, uh, but still uh, the younger generation, they didn't have the place. Uh, there was no place for them in these public theaters. So they started to use all kinds of, um, of spaces mostly underground, uh, small cafes, like the most, uh, uh, the well-known one is Greenhouse Cafe, um, where all the, these names coming, uh, the, new, the new generation, they all started uh, their productions there. Um, and then they formed kind of a parallel culture. It was like, if you compare to New York, uh, the, the, the off movement, uh, in a way, and some of them, uh, in time, they were um, they were invited by the public theaters because they have they had success and they had uh, they had a, a new audience, which is um, which is uh, something that uh, public theaters are also interested in. Um, the small performing spaces uh, force the, the actors to play in a very minimalist style, and this is very different from the old acting school in Romania. Uh, that's uh, one of the things that developed because of these small uh, performing spaces. Next, please. One of these, uh, I 
think it's one of maybe the most relevant production day in um, in our um, cafe was uh, Stop the Tempo by Jen, written and directed by Janian Prasnariu. Um, the play included poetry signed by a young poet and it was declared the 2000 generation performance because it was very representative for the the vibe, the new vibe that this, this generation uh, had. They were, uh, the play was speaking about the revolt of, a new, of this new generation against a society very caught up in the capitalist trends. Um, Janina was using uh, very few things, <laughs> three actors with flashlights, uh, and she left uh, the audience in the dark. Uh, that was a very powerful um, series of choice and um, uh, a very powerful uh, production. Uh, actually, Stop the Tempo is included in a volume that uh, the Martin Siegel Center published. It's uh, one of the, yeah. of the plays in this volume that you can find outside. Next, please. Um, the most important project of the 2000s uh, was the Drama Coup project, um, studied by uh, four um, young uh, theater directors. They were still studying uh, in the um, Duke's University of Theater and Film. Um, uh, and their professor, Nicolae Manda, uh, they started to uh, search for new material. Uh, they simply said, we don't want to stage classics anymore. We are not interested in the, um, the playwrights that we have because they use this metaphorical language. Uh, they, they are still caught up in the, in, the, in the past and we want to speak about our new realities, about our new world. So how can we do that? Uh, they initiated this annual contest um, and they managed uh, in a few years to uh, gather a lot of new uh, playwrights, new voices, and to commission uh, translations of new plays from uh, other uh, cultures because we, are, we were at, at that point uh, still very isolated, even though they were well, more than 10 years past uh, after the 1989 moment. Next. This, the drama Coup project was very successful, fortunately, and um, this kind of changed uh, the face of the Romanian theater because uh, new audiences uh, came to theater. And uh, yeah, I see Janina uh, laughing because here she's in a in a picture with I'm I'm I took this picture in Berlin. We were all there invited by Shopping and Theater and uh, Thomas Ostermeyer. Uh, he helped a lot uh, in um, making her relevant for, um, for the European stage uh, and uh, they, uh, at Chopin, they presented their uh, productions, um, Janina's and Pekka Stefan's production. Uh, Pekka is one of the new voices that Drama Home uh, Contest um, helped to, be, uh, to become very uh, well known for the younger generations. And uh, he's also already familiar to the um, to theater audiences in New York because he's starting working with Anna Marginano and Camila um, for Pop-Up Theatrics Company and you, I hope you will hear more about him and their work. Next please. Um, meanwhile, uh, Janina Karbunayu went on writing her own text <laughs> and directing them. Uh, some, sometimes uh, her plays are uh, staged by other directors all around Europe and not only. Um, and in 2014, she was um, invited to Avignon, 18 years after the last Romanian director, Silvio Cocareta, of course. Um, so um, last year, she had a great success in uh, Avignon Festival um, with a production of National Theatre Institute called Solitaritate, which is a crossword between solidarity and solitarity. Um, because Janina is very, um, She's talking a lot, a lot about uh, the lack of solidarity in uh, Romanian society, and I couldn't agree more. That's one of the phenomena that we have, we witness there. Uh, but lately, I think that's going to be changed. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, next one. So uh, I'm proud to uh, introduce uh, Janina Karbunayu, one of the leaders of the new generation in Romanian theater. Um, not only for her plays, which are already translating into many, uh, many languages all around Europe, but also because she's an advocate and she 
she's a voice speaking up for uh, the improvement of the working conditions in Romanian theater in general. Um, for depoliticization of the theater environment, politics are still very present in, in, in theater and in arts in general, which is not very healthy. Uh, and she speaks up for equity and respect for the younger artists. Um, so she's using her uh, capital and her visibility to speak about um, the general problems uh, and to advocate to change them. So, um, yeah, I think that's about it. I don't know if it's not. <laughs> um, we will uh, now hear the reading and uh, we will we'll be in the panel afterwards and if you have uh, questions, we, we are here to answer them. Thank you. Since there is no stage manager, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to tell you a few things. <laughs> this play is Mihaila, the Tiger of Our Town. It's by Giannina Carbonariu, hopefully I didn't put your best pronunciation, because uh, she's here. It's translated by James Christian Brown, who has an easier name, so of course he's not here. Um, <laughs> we three are the actors. We'll be playing the documentary makers. There are a couple of scenes and we'll be playing in scene one, taxi driver, scene two, homeless person one, homeless person two, scene three, Japanese tourist, French tourist, translator, scene four, representatives of the population of pigeons, crows, and sparrows, scene five is cup, scene six, school, scene seven, owner of the car, car of the owner, scene eight, doctor, scene nine, bank branch manager and employee, scene 10, new zookeeper, scene 11, animal one, animal two, animal three. Shall we begin? Sure. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to our play. The story we are going to present is the tale of a Siberian tiger born in a nice, average-sized European city. Two years ago, Mihaila the Tigress escaped from our city's zoo and wandered free for almost five hours before the authorities managed to track her down. We wanted to understand the circumstances in which this happened, and so we tried to document every step that the big cat took right from the moment when she left her cage. We mainly used our own interviews, but there are also some material taken from the archives of a local TV station. What you're about to see is thus a documentary a uh, play built up out of interviews with a good number of those who interacted with Mihaila and who are willing to share their experiences with us. We thank them all for their kindness and assure them that we have done our best to remain faithful to their statements. Scene one, interview with the taxi driver. So, what was it like? I'll tell you what it was like. It was, uh, it must have been nine o'clock, 10 past, 20 past at the most. I took a group of tourists to the zoo. Uh, no sooner had the tourists got out of the car than I found myself with, what can I say? I didn't even see when he got into the back seat. And once the customer's in the car, you can't say no. Customer is a customer. And you know, you don't even bother with what they look like these days, do you? As long as they're a customer and they've got the money. I took it. He wanted me to take him to the center. You know, all right, if I leave you beside the pedestrian area. I took it. He agreed. Now, to be honest, I did most of the talking along the way. Well, I don't know I, about this and that. Uh, you know. Oh, yes, I know, I know about the city and about how nice it is here, especially the center. Uh, completely renovated. We have a very nice city, very quiet, and the people are welcoming and hardworking. We have a city, uh, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> like any self-respecting European city should be, a real jewel, and we're very proud of it. Of course, there are parts that are rather uh, not so pleasant so to speak, but 
That will be dealt with in time. You can't tackle everything all at once, but these are small problems. Nothing important. Yeah, like the problems with the... But that's not the fault of the city. These are problems that come from the outside. Yeah? Oh, yeah. From the south. It's from the south that all these problems come now. They, they brought them here from the south. There's lots of them here from the south. They come up here, they like it, and unfortunately they stay. <coughs> they're noisy, they're aggressive. <laughs> There's no way you can go with them. I pointed them out on the street. You know, look at them. See how they hang around in groups, especially near the parks all day and at night. What more can I say? You, you just can't go that way. I, I mean, you do go, but it's at your own risk. They brought them here when the summit was on. They, they cleaned up the capital to look like a European city, put them in trucks, and dumped them here. Seemingly, it would cost a lot to kill them all. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It, it, there's got to be some solution. Put them in a field somewhere on the edge of town, for example. I don't know. I don't know if they've bitten anyone. I, I, mean, I mean, I don't personally know anyone that's been bitten by one of those wretched dogs. But of course they've bitten people. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty much uh, what the discussion was about. He listened, seemed interested, although he was looking out the window all the time like a tourist, admiring everything. I think he liked what he saw. I arrived behind, beside the uh, pedestrian area, and I said, I'll leave you here. He opened the door and made to get out. I said, hey, that'll be 15, man. It's not free. What's this about? He gave me a puzzled look. And I said, look, I'll do a deal with you. You wipe my windshield and clean my mirrors, and we'll call it even. No free rides here. Everyone works in this city. He wiped my windshield. He wiped my mirrors and my headlights with his fur coat. He was well wrapped up. He had a, a fur coat, like, real nice. And then he headed off, quick down the pedestrian street. After that, I got on with my business. I, I picked up another group of tourists. So I guess it was 9.40. I hope I'm getting the right answers. Scene two, interview with two homeless people in the Central Park. We'll tell you how it happened. I saw him first. I saw him before you. He spoke to me first. I didn't hear him say anything until I invited him to drink with us. Then he nodded, meaning yes. He felt like down in the feet. We didn't invite him. He invited himself. We don't just invite anyone to drink with us, you know. Yeah, but, but she wasn't just anyone. Oh, was like, she, she was no hot shakes. Pardon me, at the end of the day, she was nothing but a... Anyway, it was me that I realized she was a she and not a he. You can't even tell if you're a he or a she. <laughs> <laughs> he said, hey, fur coat. Come over here. Fur coats are feminine. The thing is that, that that day I got home with some cash and I had just got a bottle of the hard stuff. The rubbing alcohol to be exact. We mix it with the same quantity of water. So it goes further and so we don't go blind. We come here to the park. We sit on a bench behind the trees so no one bothers. We have two of these clear plastic bottles. One of water from that fountain over there and the other one is empty. We pour the water into the empty bottle like so till it's half full. And then we pour in the alcohol till it's full. We mix it like so. And I gave her some of mine to drink. That's not true. I gave her mine first. You didn't even want to share. Come on, didn't I say it doesn't matter who was first? Let's just, let's tell the story so that people can understand it because it's a story that they're interested in, not who was first. No? So we gave her a drink 
And we asked her, look, where are you from? And she's like, I'm from here. Where else would I be from? Well, no, fucking, I... Pardon me. I said, well, you don't say. <laughs> from here? From this city? I insisted. Because I go by the principle that it's not the clothes that make the man, but the man that makes the clothes. Or the fur, at any rate. And she's like, yes, I was born here in this city. And your parents, where are they from? And she's like, they're from here too. Actually born here, right here? No, they're uh, 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 from Siberia. <laughs> Who are you see? That's the catch. You can only say you're really from here when you're third generation. <coughs> <laughs> All right, but at the end of the day, the important thing is to get on with your own business. Yes, that's what I said when I saw there'd be no end of it with him, with, with her. She started to get annoyed. That third generation thing didn't go down well. She didn't yell or anything, but she started sort of growling. And we didn't fancy having some beat cop coming along to ask what we were up to. The important thing is to get on with your own business. <clears throat> it keep in your place. If everyone keeps in their place, there's peace and quiet. There's prosperity. It's a, a win-win situation. And after that, we asked her what she did. Well, it turns out she didn't have a job, right? And, and, and here I said to her, you know, in this city, you haven't got a job, you need to get one. If you don't work, you don't live. It's not like other places. That's yeah. all there is to it, fur coat, my dear. You gotta go look for work. And, and then, you see, this idea came to me. It came to him. <laughs> so I said, I said, I said, I would go. <clears throat> he said, look here, fur coat. We'll arrange some work for you. But you've got to be serious. You see, the thing is, foreigners like faces that are strange, a bit exotic. Yeah, you should see how many photos I make. The tourists think we don't realize that they're taking that they're taking pictures of buildings or something. But we know that actually they want photos of us because we're a bit special. Yeah, they've got buildings at home too, haven't they? Like maybe even nicer ones. So, so I say, come with us. They'll take photos with you in them and we'll share the takings 50-50. She didn't negotiate. Not what she could negotiate, was there? It was your idea. You hired us. It was my idea, but that doesn't matter. She accepted. No way she could refuse, because you said to her, the first day you work for nothing because we gave you a drink. No such thing as a free drink. You've got to pay somehow. And she accepted. We went to the center, to the places where they usually take pictures. To the objective, as they say. <laughs> Talk about success. The tourists were coming in droves. In 10 minutes, the takings were as much as we usually make in a whole day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I said, let's take a break. We've earned it. I'll go and get a bottle of alcohol from the shop. And I'll go get some water from the drinking fountain. I left him alone. I put a hat in front of him. I mean, if anybody wants a photo, they can help themselves and pay for it. <laughs> You were the first to say, let's take a break. It doesn't matter how we, the thing is, we trusted her. We trusted in her good faith. And in the good faith of Taurus, yeah. fucking, pardon me. The, the thing is that we came back in about, how long could it be? Half hour? With us. Let's say an hour. There was a line at the shop, and we stopped along the way, too. <laughs> <laughs> and when we got back, she was gone. She abandoned her post. It was only to be expected. She didn't seem to like the work. She didn't have much experience, either. With the tourists, you got to know how to get under their skin. Yeah, tourism isn't just a matter of you've, you've got to know what to offer people. And of 
above all, how? To get on with your own business. Yeah, you've got to like the work of it, too. Honestly, I don't think she liked it. it, it she got used to the static sector. Like, we realized afterwards when we found out where she came from. She just sat there. She just got her grub and slept all day. Seemingly, she didn't move all day. The tourists would throw stones through the fence, and she still didn't move. That is no way to do business. That's right. It's different when you get out of the cage. Into the, the free market, like they say? The proof being that she couldn't take the strain. Well, it's more comfortable sitting and waiting for food to come to you, <clears throat> isn't it? Scene three. Interview taken from a local TV station with two tourists <clears throat> who saw Mihaila. I was just arrived dans ce village, in this town. I had barely arrived in this wonderful city. A beautiful little town. In this incredibly beautiful city. I take uh, pictures everywhere I go. I have uh, probably 200 photos from this town. Uh, he takes pictures everywhere he goes and has over a thousand pictures <laughs> of this city. Everybody taking pictures. To what? To what? To the, the people who are begging everywhere you go to sit and drink a coffee? Uh, he did not have time to take pictures, but he very much enjoyed drinking coffee and sitting on cafe terraces. I wreck European cities. They are uh, different. It is very, very different culture. He likes European cities because they are so different. I take uh, pictures with buildings, not so much people. People don't stay still. I like <laughs> queer pictures. He likes to take photographs of buildings, not of people. Europeans like mascots. Uh, I like them more than people because they stay still. You can uh, take pictures with them. That's why he prefers mascots. So I was drinking a cafe in one of these restaurants outside, uh, checking my email, reading the news. A few beggars passed asking for money. On the cafe terrace, he checked his email and read the news. When he, she, uh, this creature, it is standing next to me. I said to myself, if I don't look at it, uh huh, you will go away and leave me alone. <laughs> Someone, a creature, sat down at his table without asking permission, but this didn't bother him that much. <coughs> but this creature, he did not go away. He did not say anything like, uh, please give me money or, or donnez moi un euro. It simply started to eat my omelette. <laughs> eat it. Oh. It sat at his table and didn't ask for money, but <laughs> ate his omelet, the whole omelet. This tiger, this, uh, this mascot, uh, this tiger mascot uh, was very cooperative with the camera. Uh, I, I took more than 20 photos, different angles. It is born to be model, I must say. This tiger, this mascot, this tiger mascot was very <clears throat> pleased with the unexpected photo session. After I take the pictures, uh, I say, maybe I look a, a bit at it. It was fascinating, I must say. This mascot uh, looked really real. For a few moments, I forget uh, about everything. After he had taken dozens and dozens of pictures, he thought he would look at the mascot. He found it fascinating. Yeah. It was made in a very realistic way, so much so that he forgot everything while he was looking at it. Then it drank my cafe. <laughs> and it served itself from my pack of gulwats. Uh, yes, I know. Thank you, Claire. But that is exactly what this, this creature did. I managed not to look at it one single instant. I avoided all eye contact. The creature drank his coffee and smoked just 
one of his cigarettes from his pack of boudoirs. To avoid eye contact and to keep as close as you can your belongings. He applied the method of avoiding eye contact and kept his eyes on his bag. When I wake up out of my fascination, the camera has gone. When he awoke from his fascination, his camera had disappeared. The camera is vanished with all my pictures. I have another camera, not a problem, but with other pictures. The camera had disappeared, but he is not upset because he has another one exactly the same. I complained to the police and they made like this. <laughs> he made a complaint to the police in connection with the disappearance of the camera and our police did all that they could. He appreciates their efforts and in general is, has been very impressed by the city and its inhabitants in spite of this unpleasant incident. Finally, it stood up. No merci, no au revoir, no nothing. I paid half the bill. It was evident. It, 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 it won't contribute. Ça suffit. That was the moment when I raised my eyes from Mon Porta. He paid half the bill, but the person, the creature, was unwilling to contribute. Then he lifted his eyes from his computer and looked at it. I saw him. <clears throat> he saw him. <laughs> we need something to believe in, something to all down in this crazy, crazy world. Uh, a kind of, a kind of messiah. But today, messiah cannot come in a human shape. The human shape is, is so, so compromised. We need a messiah. <laughs> so, I guess his idea to come as as a tiger, was not in the end such a bad one. Believe me, I saw him. I saw him. He saw <laughs> it. He saw it, and, and in general, uh, he too is absolutely delighted with our city and with our country. <clears throat> Scene four. Interview with the local representatives of the population of crows, pigeons, and sparrows. I'll be honest and uh, tell you straight up front. The central square belongs to the pigeons. All over Europe, all over the world, squares belong to pigeons. Uh, uh, of course, in the very first place, they belong to people, the, those who built them, they belong to children, to tourists, but right after them come the pigeons. So if, if we start from this presence, uh, this premise, basically, we don't have very much to debate. It was an act of trespass, an infringement of territory. The parks, trees and all, belong to the crows. Well, the people too, but people are so egotistical, to put it elegantly. Well, we sparrows don't know a thing. <laughs> Didn't hear a thing. Zoos are for animals and birds in captivity. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, we pass by that way too from time to time, but just visiting. We go to the zoo too, of course, like everyone else, especially when people come too because they go armed to the teeth with popcorn. When things get mixed, it's not good. The proof of all this that's happened uh, after it was announced on TV and people started shutting themselves in their homes, who were the first to suffer? The pigeons, obviously. Not a single child to be seen. We went hungry for a good few hours. And that's not fair. We all have to live together somehow. If, we really are a community, that is. For us, the crow population, as I've heard them calling us lately, was actually good. They forgot all about us for once, started bothering about more serious problems. They were even able to make a clear comparison between real dangers and invented dangers. 
We didn't see a thing, didn't hear a thing. It was a very difficult day. They simply <laughs> forgot about us. I'm telling you the truth. They're obsessed with us. And not only here in this city, in all cities, all over the world, we have a hard life. What more can I? Normally, they love us. We actually feel very comfortable here in this city. Personally, I wouldn't move anywhere else. I, I feel I belong to this culture. I really feel that. Seemingly, we attack the city. We leave dirt on the pavements, in the parks. What more can I? That's man for you. He sees the straw in someone else's eye instead of seeing the plank in his own. Maybe we have some minor disputes, you know, on the matter of droppings, for example. Uh, all the same, coming at it from our side, pigeon droppings are considered lucky. If you look around the city and see how it looks, I think we've brought our contribution toward this good luck. Seemingly, we're noisy. Us, noisy. We're damn well noisy. Do you hear that, man? Noisy. We're part of the identity of the old town. We're the symbol of peace and quiet. Defining features of the city, apart from small accidents, insignificant matters. How should we know? We don't have time to. Seemingly, we steal food? That's an aberration. We don't steal. We take the food that you throw away. We clear up for you. And another thing, if crows stay in a place, it's a sign that place is prosperous. When we don't find anything more to eat, it's goodbye. So far, that's not an issue. So I say that's a good sign. That's why the city takes care of us. Even they even put in dispensing machines with food in the square. That's a sign of recognition and respect on the part of the authorities. Those authorities don't know what to invent next. Each of their ideas is more stupid and criminal than the last. We don't know how to read. That's true. Nobody's perfect. But we're not stupid. We find things out, too. Here's the latest. A local council member has filled the city with posters saying, I'm quoting from memory here, <coughs> something like this, Dear citizen, we have received numerous complaints regarding the problem that for some time has been troubling the district and the neighborhood in which you live, and I refer here to the birds, especially starlings and crows that have nested in the trees in the high school yard. I am aware of the fact that these birds are troublesome from several points of view, including the mess, the noise, and the smell. The method that I propose be applied urgently, as it is the fastest and the least costly, is to drive them away with gunfire. I shall take personal charge of solving this problem. Yours sincerely, Council Member. I didn't remember his name, you know. Not that I couldn't. But I didn't want to, man. I don't remember the names of all the fools. I don't know what comment to make either. What comment can you make on such a genocide? We saw her, but we didn't go too near. With creatures like that, you never know. You, you, you have to keep a distance. I saw her, obviously, but I didn't go too close because I'm not stupid. I stuck with the gang and we looked down from above from the top of a tree. We had a laugh, too. It was a real joke. All those hunters and all the armed forces were in the woods while she was wandering free from the city. All right. You got to have perspective to see that. But what kind of perspective can that army of criminals have? No one pees in our city like that. No one pees like that on us because that's what the likes of her do. They, they pee, they invade the territory, they mark it. We have had a few cases of fainting among our numbers that day from the smell of pee, obviously. The good thing it ended well. It was an unpleasant incident, but as usual, the authorities did their duty. I'm, I'm satisfied. Uh, all of us, the whole population of pigeons are satisfied. 
bunch of bloodthirsty criminals. <laughs> Come on, man. Can't you wander through the city, or even over the city, anymore? Does it say anywhere, no tigers, or no crows? Does it say that anywhere? Does it? We sparrows didn't hear a thing. <laughs> we don't have time to. We spend all day sitting on cafe terraces with our eyes on tourist plates. Maybe, just maybe, there'll be something left over, but not much. You people have such an appetite. Now, of course, a number of us were lost that day. About 45. And my sister, so that's 46. She was looking into some tourist plate when Hyla, I mean Mrs. Tiger, <laughs> approached. And bang! That was her, gone. My sister. But she had only herself to blame for not paying attention. What can you do? These things happen. interview with the school. So, when she arrived in front of the big stairs, it was 12, uh, maybe a little earlier, when the old bells of the old clock in the old tower rang 12 o'clock, she was already there. Luckily, all the children were already inside after the lunch break. That, that was when we saw her. She just stood there. She stood there for almost 20 minutes. She was just standing there and staring at. I have no idea what she was staring at. Me, probably. The children, maybe. I was trying to guess what was in her mind. What were her eyes trying to say? What her plans were? Would she just sit there? Or would she try to get it inside? The pupils, the teachers, the principal, everybody was looking from the windows, taking pictures, making signs to her, different signs. But she didn't move. She just sat there. She just sat there and just, just wanted, I don't know, to belong, maybe. But think for yourselves. I can't open my doors to a... I have to think of the security issues and about the student base. Many parents would take their children to other schools immediately, and then we would have to close. <coughs> As a school, I am responsible for education. <coughs> Inside these beautiful brick walls, education has been going on for over 200 years, and I can't throw it all away because of a... Well, but then she just left. But later, when we heard what had happened, well, nobody has to suffer from this event. At least not from our side, and that's basically my responsibility. Scene seven. Interview with the owner of the car and the car of the owner. Well, there's not much to tell you. The moment someone threatens my property, I'm, as they say, I... Furious. Entitled. Yes, entitled to retaliate. Because by the time the law comes to give me justice, those guys can come and do what they like in my house. It didn't actually enter the house. Let's not it, well, he followed me into the yard. It had just, I had just come home. 
in my car. That's me. <laughs> okay, well, I have very tall, strong gates. Yes. Basically, there's no way you can get past them. You can't see a thing through our gates. Yes. Well, for all that, when I get out of the car, I found myself face to face with this animal. And this, this animal plunked down right by the door. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but there's no other word I can use. Well, that's what it was, too, is an animal. <laughs> I mean, it was. I said, what business have you got an animal like you in my yard? Kindly get the hell off to where you came from. And he had no intention of moving, probably attracted by the sound of my car. <laughs> it has an amazing engine. <laughs> anyway, I saw he wasn't going to leave, so I went into the house. It started to scratch my door, <coughs> right around here. I went in, took my rifle from the cupboard. I knew what a rage Sweetums would get into when she saw. <laughs> well, I was stunned. What can I say? No, wait a minute. I want you to understand where I'm coming from. When I go out into the city, I only ever park beside cars of the same caliber. <laughs> because the guys with Renaults, Peugeots, trash like that, it's no problem for them to get their car scratched. But for someone like me, who's got a Maserati, a Bugatti, something like that, he opens his door carefully, pays attention to how he parks, right? So when I saw that that fucking animal had done to me, I'm sorry? No other word I can use. Well, it actually is an animal. I mean, it was. Is this kind of thing possible in a country where property is guaranteed by law? Well, I went right up to him, and there he was, mouth wide open, growling in his own language. And since his mouth was open wide, I stuck the rifle barrel between his teeth. He didn't move. So I opened the boot, took out a wrench. I was so angry I didn't know where to start. So I pulled out one of his nails. Claws. Then I pulled out the rest. On the principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and a claw for a scratch. He didn't even say boo. Mm -hmm. What the hell could the animal say when I had all the evidence that he had trespassed on my private property? Devastating. My private property. I said, get the hell out of here before I call the police. I was, what's the word? Generous. I was raging. Someone else in my place would have knocked him flat or made him pay for a new car. But how would a fucking animal like that pay? pay? So I made this necklace out of his claws. Put it here on the dashboard. The animal's claws symbolize passion, courage, and extreme agility. <laughs> Scene eight, interview with the ER doctor. That's how it is in the ER. One goes out, in comes the next, and you don't even look at the patient's face. You're still sewing on, you're like a sewing machine on autopilot. At a certain point, in came the, uh, the individual. He had rather nasty wounds, severe bleeding from the upper and lower limbs. I started to sew him up. Uh, two minutes later, another patient barged in, and I was sewing up the one, and in came the other, and he said, when are you taking me? I'm dying out here. And, I said, if you take his place, then I can't guarantee that someone else won't take your place. The guy started yelling that his life was more important than the life of a... Well, 
You know the kind of discourse. I don't see any need to. Yelling away and me sewing away at the other, and suddenly I lost my tape temper and, yes, I, I stuck him in the wrong place with it. Because the one I was sewing started howling with pain too, and I was, how, how can I describe it? A blood curdling howl, and then I started howling too, like, ah! Something like that. And when I finished, the guy who had barged in had gone, and the other wasn't howling anymore either, so I sewed him up and left. Apparently, they heard it all through the hospital. The next day, after some, uh, I kept thinking about it. And in the end, I sent some applications to hospitals abroad. Right then, the very next day, <coughs> I've already had answers from Britain and from Germany. <laughs> Scene nine, interview with the bank manager and his employee. It was 12.45. Uh, it says so on her ticket number for the line. She left it on the desk. Of course, I don't sit at the front desk. I came later. My colleague can give you more details. He interacted directly with... I didn't realize at first what the customer wanted. To ask for information, to open an account with us, to take out a loan. Uh, of course, not all of our customers who come into a bank know how to formulate their requests. There are a lot of elderly people or, or people without any education in banking matters. So we try to help them. Of course, there are also situations especially these days when quite a few customers come in rather, rather embarrassed. Uh, especially those who are interested in loans for house purchase. I've noticed that they don't know quite how to explain what they want. Not because they don't know what they want, but just because they know they've got no chance of getting what they want. And still, they come to get information, which is, in principle, a good thing. Uh, the main problem that we come up against, I mean, we don't come up against it, they do, is that their salaries are too low. Just please. Uh, meanwhile, the big line had formed behind her, behind the lady. There have been staffing cuts here, too. There's no way out of it, the, the crisis, the competition. But still, we manage very well like this. Those who are left have become more active, more efficient, which in principle is a good thing. I finished the explanations, but the customer just sat there. Which in principle is a, a good thing. It means that this is a genuinely interested customer who wants to find out more details. I asked her repeatedly, is there anything else I can help you with? Please tell me if I can be of any more assistance. As you can see, there are a lot of customers waiting behind you. Of course, the customers had started to grumble. I was getting the blame for not moving fast enough. I asked for her ID. She produced it, name Mihaila. I couldn't find her in the system. I deduced, logically, that she didn't have a card either or any other credit with us. I presumed that she wanted a personal needs loan. I looked at the customer, trying to guess what she might offer as security. She didn't say anything. We train our staff to be one step ahead of the customer, to realize what solutions might be found to help them, which in principle is a good thing, isn't it? Right away, I identified the one thing that could serve security, her fur coat. I explained the conditions, the steps she would have to take. I showed her the contract. And here's the contract, signed uh, by the bank and by the customer. I valued it at 5,000 euro. I gave her a loan of 250 euro. When it came to giving her the money, she started to growl. I don't know what got into her because I talked nicely to her, very politely, very calmly. She didn't want to take the money. She threw it on the floor. Well, her money, her business. I made a sign for the security guard to come. <laughs> I, I left the secure, security guard with the customer, and I went to inform the manager. Which, in principle, is a good thing. These days, you never know what can happen. People are desperate, and when they are desperate, they resort to all sorts of 
all sorts of extreme measures. See, it had never happened to us before. We weren't scared. We had no reason to be. We have a security system and the protections and video cameras. Although in the video, its head, I mean her face, doesn't show very clearly. By the time I got there, she has gone. So I personally didn't see her. The money had gone too. The people waiting behind her had picked it up off the floor. Well, her money, her business. They picked it all up in a couple of seconds. No, we weren't scared. We had no reason to be. It's quite difficult to rob a bank these days. Uh, about as difficult as taking out a loan. <laughs> Which in principle is a good thing. I, I mean the protection, I mean. Sorry. Now, I'll tell you the story of the fur coat. Uh, it, it's a nightmare. Uh, our lawyers are trying to pick apart the threads of the story. Basically, at this moment, we should recover the fur coat. We have a contract signed with the customer. Of course, she unfortunately is now deceased. However, the fur coat belongs to us according to the contract, except that now the zoo claims that this customer was its property, fur coat and all. In other words, they claim that the fur coat didn't belong to the customer, so she can, couldn't use it as security. Which to us seems <laughs> atrocious, uh, uh, absurd, uh, uh, aberrant. Uh, but, but, but that's not all. The zoo has donated the fur and the bones to the faculty of biology for study. And now the university says that they are the rightful owners. The, the whole thing is terribly complicated. Still, we, I mean our lawyers, uh, hoped to recover what can still be recovered. At, at the end of the day, we have a contract, and all we are asking is that it should be respected, which, in principle, is a good thing, isn't it? Scene 10. Interview with the new zookeeper. Diagnosis of acute depression. Caused by the disappearance of somebody you, uh, of somebody you love. It is not easy to get over, to get over a disappearance like that. Something you can't explain to yourself. You were together sharing the same space. You opened your eyes every day seeing the other one, and one day she just, she just disappears. Yeah, and she just, vanishes without, you know, saying anything, jumping into nowhere. Your mind just, it can't understand, you know, it, it, it is probably more difficult to understand than death. At least you can see the dead body. Yeah. <clears throat> the dead body is like the evidence of something that's not there anymore, but, but used to be, and when you don't ha even have that, your mind is blown away. You're stuck in just, just like you're, you're just, uh, I don't know, what more can I say? It was such a painful thing to see, really depressing. Medically speaking, they, they say depression isn't contagious. The hell it isn't. I mean, let me tell you, the moment somebody is depressed, people run away like crazy. Like there's this, I don't know, an energy or vibe, or something you can't touch, but it touches everyone in a very strange way. Like you see these, you see, these days, we try not to look at, I mean, we constantly turn our eyes away from the, you know, things that are, let's say, dirty, or painful, or just disturbing, right? We don't, I mean, do you see people showing unhappy moments on Facebook? <laughs> I mean, maybe sometimes, like, rarely, but when they do, they are actually looking for compassion or sympathy, but, but did you ever see desperate? really desperate people taking photos of themselves and posting them. I, 
closed my Facebook page some time ago. I couldn't stand all this social hypocrisy, all these like, like sad faces. Fucking annoying. Well, still not so fucking annoying as the happy faces. Yeah, depression is something people do not want to see because they don't yet have an icon to cope with that. <laughs> like, I don't know, just, just trying to, just being it. I'm trying to, to be human, maybe. Because it, it, it's hard. It's so fucking hard. It's like, well, I know it so well that I was employed here just after the, after the event with Mahila. I was working in another place with better pay and, and stuff. And, you know, then I had some, some problems. And for a long time, I just I couldn't find the proper job in my field. I tried to find one closer to my. Finally, I said, after all, why not this one? Since nobody wanted to take it after the event. It was my luck. Nobody wanted to apply for it, so in the end, they had to give it to me. No, I'm not afraid. Not at all. Why should I be? Let me tell you something. Animals are not as dangerous as people. Animals are not, they're not as, <coughs> as, I'm sorry, can you, can you just, can you turn the camera on for a second? Okay. The idea is that people come here to, they don't want to see, just put yourself in our position, in the position of zoo's management. You have a little tiger, a, a baby, a tiger baby, totally depressed. He doesn't move. People working at the zoo, visitors, children, everybody. So we, you know that there's this thing. You can exchange animals between zoos. <coughs> That's what we did. We exchanged for zero. That, that was the name of Mihaila's son. We exchanged him for a pair of kangaroos. No. Actually, we didn't tell them that he was depressed. It was a zoo in Germany. They didn't know too much about the story, so we thought in the beginning maybe it was right, wasn't right not to tell them the truth. But you know what? Kangaroos they gave us, they're depressed too. <laughs> yeah, but at least they jump. <laughs> so, I guess in the end, uh, 
exchange was quite fair. Scene 11, interview with anonymous animals at the zoo. Really? That happened at our zoo? All I know is the official version, the, the one that was. I mean, I think we remember it sort of. But not with the details. details. No, I can't help you. Being her neighbor, I saw everything. That morning, Tuesday, wasn't it? No, I think it was Saturday or Sunday because they were tourists. There's something else. They, they come first thing in the morning, give us no peace for two days. Photographs, video, twigs, popcorn, screens, the kind of species that these tourists are. I can't stand them. They drive us out of our minds so much that by Sunday evening, we end up beating each other. I mean, I beat you lots of times, and you, me, I, you, you should see the fights. The blood, broken hands, torn faces. Monday morning, you'd think there'd been a war. You, you should come by and see it sometime. As I was saying, that morning, Mr. C, the keeper, swept the enclosure, went out, pushed the door to, but didn't shut it. He emptied the waste bucket into a sack that he had on a wheelbarrow, went in to see her and the others, stopped for a chat as usual. He's a friendly man, is Mr. C. Yeah, there's no end to the story. He'll tell you. Don't interrupt me or I'll lose the thread. Well, then Mr. C opened the safety lock to let them into the enclosure. And that's when she saw the open door. And she went out, obviously. Who wouldn't have done it? Two paces, I think, she had taken when Mr. C saw her. He went up to her and said, what are you up to? <clears throat> hey, Mihaila. And she's like, I'm just going out for a little walk. And he's like, hey, come back here, girl. You want to ruin me? They'll fire me. I'll lose my job. And Mr. C was right. They, they, they actually did fire him. Honestly, I mean... <laughs> Didn't you hear me say no interruptions? <laughs> right then. She's outside, and she's like, Take it easy, Mr. C. I'm just going out. See the town for myself. You'll get lost. Uh, and he says, Hey, Mihaila. What do you have to see the town for? It's not for you. You'll get lost, and you won't know your way back. And she's like, I'll mark my territory. You think I'm stupid? <laughs> and he says, hey, girl, think of me. What am I going to tell them? And from outside, she's like, I don't know, Mr. C. Tell them the truth, that I've gone out to see the world for myself. And he says, there are strict rules here. No one goes out just, just when they feel like it. You know what happens to animals that run away from the zoo? And she's out there. And she's like, well, what happens? And he says, the people shoot them. They don't stop to talk it over like we're doing now. Yeah, and Mr. C was right about that, too. Stop interrupting me or I'll smash your face in. And she's out there, and she's like, I'll take the risk. I want to see the world for myself. I'm dying of boredom here, Mr. C. These tourists drive me out of my mind. And he says, hey, kid, you don't know what freedom's like. You were born in captivity. You don't have the reflexes to, to defend yourself, to get by. And these folks don't have time to stop and talk. They'll execute you, and that'll be the end of it. Plus, you don't know the language. And she's out there, and she's like, oh, nerd. And he's like, hey, Mihaila, here, you're an attraction. It's a different matter outside. People like to come and visit you, but they don't like to be visited. <laughs> come on, be a good girl and come back inside. And she's like, Mr. Costica? No. Kisses. <laughs> and she turned her back on him and she was off. She ran into the woods. After that, I don't know. Well, when word got round that 
Mihaila had gone for a walk. You know what it was like? It was empty, not a soul. Just lots of bags on benches. They ran away before you could say boo. Uh, after that, I, I personally don't know. Well, all I know is that they shot her. And now the question is, like, did we make her go? What we know is this. Our vet went out with his tranquilizer. The one he uses to put us all to sleep? We've got a real horror at that thing. There was a professional hunter, too. The one that shot her? The vet shot first with the tranquilizer, and she got angry because she was on her way back to the cage, man. There's no way you can get along with people. All their great airs of being more enlightened than us, more civilized, and not being animal. But if that's civilization, no thanks. Supposedly she jumped at them when they fired the tranquilizer. I heard she was calm. I mean, she gave them the sort of look that they thought she was upset, but in fact, she wanted to explain, to say something to them. But she didn't get the chance to hunt her fire. No, Mahila, though. Let's not forget what she got in her animal record. Meaning? Meaning? Well, didn't she rip open a tourist's leg a year ago? But didn't he provoke her? He kept sticking his food through the fence. He threw all sorts of things at her because she wasn't taking any notice of it. I, for one, wouldn't have stooped to his level. And then, did I make her go? Mahila never fought with anyone but herself. That's the truth. Mr. C got fired. The director resigned, and so on. One inquiry after another, one TV channel after another. A black mark against the zoo. A black mark against the city. It is true that she didn't think very much about us, about, about the rest of us. I mean, wasn't it because of her that they put up the, the electric fences? I could hardly turn around my cage as it was. Now I have to take care not to get fried. So did we make her go out? Did I make her? Did you make her? It was all her own fault. Shut up, you. I don't know what you're on about. Oh, you shut up. Why should I shut up? You never stopped eating all, talking all day. No Get up, or you'll be sorry. You see these claws? Oh, your snout. Enough! Stop this howling! Are we wild or something? Maybe you want a taste too. Go on, lay into him! And then we wonder the, the opinion of these people and what, what, uh, why they have that opinion about us. Listen, you know what? You know what? No photographs. We've had enough. We're sick of publicity. And I, I'd like you not to put my real name, right? Yeah. I'm called Pussy, just to be clear. So there's no pussy there. Or, right? or Marcel, or Lily. Or Gia, or Maria, or Blackie, or Coco, or Christina, or Lucy, or Pamela, or Misha. Yes, yes, we have a right to anonymity too. And in the discussion with Mr. C, I'd rather that didn't appear in full. I mean, so that no one can tell it was me, because people make all sorts of connections, and I don't want to have problems. Because the zoo is small, and you've seen what animals are like. And, and the message, what's the, what's the message? Yeah, I mean, what light are you going to show us in? The animal identity is very important. How is the zoo going to be seen? How is it going to be presented to the city, to the country, to the world? Yeah, look here, what I, what I said about people, that, that's between you and me. I, I only use the positive bits because, because there's plenty that's positive. The business with Mihaila, that was an unpleasant incident, but we like it here. But what's the message going to be? We're a model. I really want to know what the message is going to be. The message! In general, we all live in peace and quiet. In general, we mind our own business. In general, we love the tourists. In general, we love the people. In general, we love one another here. We respect one another. In we help one another. In general, we are solitary amongst ourselves. We are very solitary. Uh, solitary. You're really looking for trouble, aren't you? <laughs> Come on, say it. So, in general, we're not just solitary, we're very solitary, man. In general, we're all right. Could be better. In fact, and we wish you the same. Is that recorded? Is that recorded? Is that recorded? <laughs> Thank you so much.
much. And um, let's show you how it works. interested in the story of the tiger, but in the way that the um, town reflected that event. And uh, I was very much interested in the people of this town. Not uh, of this town particularly, but this town is um, it's a very um, middle-sized European town. It's very relevant for a kind of mentality kind of conservative, um, close, it's a close community, and they are, yeah, like, a, more and more, a lot of um, European cities, these kind of cities are, I don't know, feeding these fears they have uh, for the stranger, for the unusual. Yeah, I think um, it is, uh, one could say it's a documentary place, so and we wanted to capture something real. In a way, it's kind of a, <coughs> a, a, a magic realism documentary, a theater play. Cars talk, animals talk, um, and uh, we, we hear from from all around. It. So, is that um, is that um, um, something you feel um, is capturing um, that, that moment of transition in, in, a, in a stronger way? Of let's if, let's have say you just like put on what so many people do. They do a documentary. You know, describe the words. We can read fake to leave in the ums or the ums and say, oh, that's real. And we are all obsessed. We live in a time of uh, um, fanatism, of realism, of data collection, meta collections of data. And theater has to be real, TV has to be real, what's real, and we all know whatever one thinks of real is made up. But y your idea is to, um, to, to, to put it in some kind of a fairy tale thing, but still it's, it's very moving. So is that an idea of you to really to use this kind of new realism or is that an idea of, um, of a theatrical fairy tale when you try to explain something in a direction sense um, uh, to the world? Well actually I, uh, I did and I do a lot of documentary theater and I'm really um, interested in uh, reality realities and in the ways you can you can translate that on stage. So this play in, in uh, I mean, it, it's very different from everything I've done. And actually I took this liberty, this freedom to, to, to have some distance to documentary theater and actually mocking the methods that I use. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's a good thing at some point to make fun of yourself and of your own methods. Um, I didn't write a play like this before, and I don't think I will write another one like this. But for me, it was interesting to, to play a lot with these um, conventions. For instance, you will have uh, this scene with the pigeons, the crows, the sparrows. But actually, they were real people uh, having this kind of um, speech. And uh, it's interesting to maybe to see it from this uh, but they are real people. I mean, and that's what um, we spoke before. That the actors. I mean, Tamila knew that the, the actors don't have to take birds. They don't have to take animals. It's people. It's speech. It's yeah. It's a human speech. Like a tradition of a and uh, um, and, um, and 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 I 
other. So it, it is quite interesting that at a time we heard before from Christina that uh, some certain state of forms you know, were forbidden. People actually had to stop working because it was not under socialist realism, and that was uh, shown. Also, you don't show what some people coined as a capitalist realism. You also, you know, transform this in, in, in a truly imaginary um, a way, and I think this is why it is so interesting, and one just cannot stop listening and imagining um, that play, and it felt it captured something um, of a of a transition of people who are lost, who all of a sudden have to face, for, even for a short moment, a moment of revolution or um, a change in society. When animals escape, it does capture imagination. I know there was um, just in the, I think, the Belarus, uh, 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 the entire um, uh, circus was opened up. And they were, I live in Montclair, there were two brown bears or three brown bears, um, uh, black bears, uh, going around in the streets, and the people have seen them or not. And um, so um, something uh, came up. So it's uh, quite an interesting, uh, beautiful um, 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 description of a moment, you know, in time. Is that, is that does it fit in in the contemporary theater scene, or do you feel it's uh, um, some, something very exceptional? Or what she does is this kind of a new way of uh, storytelling as a magic um, capitalist realism. I don't know. Is that, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, there's another level that I see. Um, this play is talking about uh, how can you enjoy freedom when you are born in captivity? And I think this is sum up, in a way, our question as a society. How can you learn how to, it's a huge responsibility to be, to be free and to deal with this freedom. And uh, when you are born in captivity, <laughs> uh, it's even more difficult. Um, so yeah, like Janina said, uh, this play is very different from the others in, uh, the other place of her, um, it's a mockumentary, uh, but um, the other place are, um, they also have a level of uh, um, magic in a way, uh, it, each of them in a different way. Uh, they are inspired by, by reality, because as I said, uh, the new, this new generation uh, wanted to uh, dive in into the, these realities. Uh, they were very, uh, obsessed with uh, reading the reality, uh, but I think the most interesting step is uh, getting uh, outside this reality, not be captive in this reality, and invent a, a form, uh, a, voc a personal vocabulary to translate <coughs> these uh, new realities. Uh, and I think uh, Janina is uh, the most advanced in this, uh, in this journey that uh, playwrights had to take um, to come from reality uh, and translate this reality with a personal vocabulary. I think that's uh, an interesting um, thing that she's doing. Well, uh, Janina, there's a question before we come to Mila and also you. I mean, it used to be that people got shot in East Berlin or when they, before the 89, they tried to get out. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote this recently where there is this kind of freedom to explore, um, but if the tiger, you still got shot. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you, is that your, um, is that in the sense that with that freedom and that being bred somehow behind walls, behind uh, a cage, like that famous Rilke poem of the panther was behind, and now there is a little bit, is that uh, doomed? Is, do you feel, is that your uh, prognosis? To be honest, the um, thing is that uh, I realize now that because it's about Romanian contemporary theater, we tend to speak about 89 and about the world. But actually when I wrote the play, which was uh, 2012, I was more thinking about the European context. Mm -hmm. I feel much more connected with what's going on now because for me, 89 is important, but it's still 27 years ago. So I think, for instance, uh, uh, this year in September, this play premiered in Stockholm, in Dramaten, and it was in September, it was uh, in uh, this time of the refugee crisis, and the audience read it that way. I mean, it was so, uh, they, connect, they didn't connect with the Romanian um, context, but with that context at that time. And I think, uh, yeah, I think I, I wanted to write at that time a play that would speak about all these nationalist trends, about these fears, about the, this political, uh, how to say, um, the way they use these fears. So I was very much interested in, in, um, in that thing. But of course, 
Yeah, we can read it in different ways. Which is the mark of every great art. And it's true, at the beginning of the reading, very much felt the you know, immigrants or people coming in and you do not know what they do. Are they dangerous? Are they not dangerous? What can they do? Timbala, you have uh, worked uh, with this um, Jemina uh, before. What's your take on this play? This is actually our first time of spending time together, though. Um, uh, I know from my colleagues um, how much it is to me that they hope Jemina's work. It's always really a, a, a real pleasure to be able to really encounter her in a face-to-face um, uh, -face in a, a situation where we're looking at her play. Um, this was an incredible experience for us, you know, fast and brief and wonderful. But even in the time that we left the rehearsal, going back to talk about the play and the repercussions of the play and the immediacy um, that, this, that this text has now in this country for us um, and how rich it was, um, it, it's such a rich exploration of our own nationalism, of our own fear of losing our America of our own idea of the other and the many different kinds of others that exist in this country. And I said, oh, here, we have to do it with five people because you have to have like the black guy, you, got, you know, you have all these different communities that separate themselves and that, you know, um, you know that, that trade teams and that so much of what we see happening here in the, in the play was about people being able, you know, um, uh, what they'll give up um, for their own identity or for their own security. And I thought it's just such a, I mean, there's just, you know, more time, more time to explore um, that, the, that our relationship to this particular text. Um, it was really a delight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I very much, you know, it is uh, that a play where a, a, a city, a town, which is in order, all the stuff from is in disorder. And then shoot the time of you and understand since I'm just trying to take a walk. I'm, I'm even going to go back, but you know, I'm just here because the door was open. So um, I think it is truly um, um, open and, um, and, and in, in its uh, structure and in its reading and for sure will be for, for many years to come. So thank you so much for coming, truly here for flying uh, from Romania also to, to share uh, the play with us. It's a really wonderful dinner. And I see a big applause to the actors. That was really uh, Tour de force with so many.
play. And when I watched your play playing, I kept on feeling like this is every one of us could read something into whatever we are experiencing into your play, which was quite delightful when you think about who we are and that all of this is about a piece of ourselves. So I, and I love the act. It was just really quite powerful. My question to you is, what did you learn in the process of doing this play? Well, actually, um, what I learned was while I was doing the interviews with the people of this town. And uh, you learned a lot while confronting your fears with other people's fears. I think you you learn a lot out of this uh, situation. Because they express their fears, but not connected with the tiger, but with other problems. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's terrible, but at the same time, good to confront them. Yeah. You might have a comment or a question? Yeah, I have one. I would help you, sorry. So, no. last one, yeah. So my name is Cyprian. I have a question. Did you try to save the tiger? To save? To save the tiger? Well, actually, uh, uh, she was dead before I started <laughs> <laughs> the, the research, so I couldn't do too much. <laughs> OK. So there is no version where There is no version yet. Unfortunately, not. No happy ending. <laughs> you have to say it is happy ending. where we end up with depressed kangaroos, or um, it might be uh, much better and much more delightful. So um, again, thank you um, so much for coming. If you have additional questions, as I'm sure you do have, and um, hopefully you all will stay around here again. Um, thank you so much, and what a great pleasure that we have the luxury and the time to really hear voices and plays from around the world. And this is one of the most original um, um, uh, uh, documentary theater plays we have ever uh, heard or seen here, and this is, of course, um, 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 and why you are such a, a great writer. So thank you so much, and we hope you come back and we'll take ideas. <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much to the actors. Thank you very much, Camila. Thank you, Christina. And thank you to all of you for being here with us tonight. Thank you.